Welcome to this seminar about Taiwan. Uh, my name is Håkan Bengtsson and I'm CEO at Arena Gruppen here in Stockholm. We're a progressive association of single members who runs a think tank, a publishing house, a, a daily web magazine and other things. Lately, we have been focusing on, on Taiwan a bit. Uh, and last year, we published the only book about Taiwan available in Swedish, actually. This one. It's out of stock. It's written by Joje Olsson uh, called Taiwan, the Unknown and uh, Threatened Democracy. Uh, but you can, you can download it free if you read Swedish from our website. So it's uh, created some interest. Uh, I think it's true to say that Taiwan has been in the shadow of public international uh, debate for a long time. Uh, however, I think it's more on the agenda now than before. Uh, for different reasons, maybe the development in Hong Kong plays a role here. Uh, and I, 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 in, in The Economist, uh, an issue a couple of weeks ago, had Taiwan on the, on the cover with, with, the, with the headline, The Most Dangerous Place on Earth. So uh, some, I think it's, it's on the agenda to, to discuss the, the, the status of Taiwan and the interest in development of democracy in, in, in Taiwan as well. Uh, and uh, a, a couple of weeks uh, ago, the, there was a documentary on Swedish television about Taiwan, which is very interesting for people living in Sweden. You can see it on, 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 on the Play website as well. Uh, and uh, one of the key persons in that documentary was Audrey Tang, who was the digital minister for uh, Taiwan. Uh, and uh, she's focusing a bit on, on your interesting work for democracy in terms of transparency and participation, etc., uh, which I hope we can discuss now in this seminar, which um, will last for uh, one hour. Uh, and um, I'm also delighted to invite Anna Sundström, who is General mm -hmm. Secretary for, for uh, uh, the Olaf Palme Institute uh, in Stockholm, uh, and also Shastin Lundgren, who is a uh, parliamentarian for the Centre Party and also a uh, member of the Foreign uh, Foreign Policy Committee in, in the Parliament. And um, uh, one of the speakers of the House of the Swedish Parliament as well. So uh, welcome to all you three. And uh, I think we, of course, start with giving the word to Audrey. Very welcome. We're very interested to hear about your views on 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 Taiwan and the future of democracy in Taiwan. Welcome. Hello and uh, greetings from the future. Like literally, we're in the afternoon now. Uh, and I would like to share my screen uh, and we'll see if it works, um, hopefully. So if you see a cute dog, the screen sharing is working correctly. You do? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So, yes, this is the, the um, companion dog. Uh, the name is Zong Chai. It's a Shiba um, of the participation officer uh, in the Ministry of Health and Welfare, really a mascot of our counter coronavirus effort. Um, we countered a, a coronavirus so far uh, with no lockdown with fingers crossed, but so far with no lockdown, uh, and counter the infodemic also uh, with no takedown. And in both um, key areas, this cute dog played a very large role, which is why I feature um, Zong Chai first. <clears throat> because um, you see in Taiwan, uh, when we realized that there is a novel coronavirus uh, last January, we learned it from the collective intelligence, from the social sector. In Taiwan, we have this idea that instead of relying on Facebook or other private sector for public collective intelligence, we have our own domestic networks, for example, the PTT, which is uh, essentially subsidized by the state, but run by National Taiwan University, a student pet project for 25 years, uh, and it's on these, uh, pro-social areas where there's no advertisers, there's no shareholders, did the initial collective intelligence, including the remixing of the memes such as Song Chai, uh, appears. So uh, in concrete terms, this co collective intelligence kicked off um, actually in 2019. Uh, in December 31st, uh, when Dr. Li Wenliang's message, and I quote, there's seven new SARS cases from the Huanan seafood market, end of quote, 
gets reposted on the PTT. Uh, I'm sure it's also posted uh, across all the world on different social media platforms, but to my knowledge, only on PTT did the result in very quick triaging from people of all the different uh, expertises so that uh, not even 24 hours later, we began health inspections for all flight passengers coming in from Wuhan uh, to Taiwan. And this is <clears throat> to the credit uh, of the Central Epidemic Command Center and the daily press conference that gathered the collective intelligence from the online uh, people and turned those innovations into decisive actions uh, literally every day, every 2 p.m. And so we rely on this <clears throat> toll-free number where everybody can call to contribute their collective intelligence tips and ideas and ask for clarifications. Recently, you can also use this as an SMS number for checking in uh, to uh, places for, to enable contact tracing. So last April, uh, there was a young boy that called 1922 saying, hey, you're rationing out Musk. But all I got from the mask rationing uh, program was pink medical mask. But all the boys in my class have navy blue uh, medical grade mask. So I don't want to wear pink to school, the boys said. Do something about it. Well, the very next day, at the suggestion of the companion of the Zong Chai dog, the participation officer suggested the Minister of Health and Welfare, Chen Shizhong in the middle, as well as all the medical officers wear pink. Uh, and so uh, Mr. Chen even said, uh, and I think Pink Panther was his childhood hero or something. So the boy became the most hit boy in his class for only he has the color that the heroes wear and the hero's hero, I guess, wear. Uh, and so this uh, gender mainstreaming is what we call humor over rumor, meaning that instead of uh, amplifying this idea of divisiveness, conspiracy theory or anything like that, we just act in a pro-social manner ourselves and contribute to a more pro-social response. For example, pink is the best color. Uh, and then for the next couple of weeks, all the leading brands color themselves pink uh, and things like that. So Musk become a uh, symbol for self-expression. It's not just uh, for the public medical purposes. And this is essential because at the time we realized that <clears throat> we need to have 75% of people wearing masks and washing their hands uh, in order to counter the very high R value of the initial uh, novel coronavirus. Of course, nowadays with the English variant, this number should be 90%, uh, and we're working on that. Uh, <clears throat> but last uh, January, 75% was our goal. But the problem was at the time, Taiwan only manufacture around 2 million medical masks a day, uh, but we have a population of 23 million. <clears throat> so we do have a rationing issue. And to solve this issue, not only did we enlist our universal health care uh, based on universal broadband so that more than 6,000 pharmacists can uh, start distributing the masks, but also the people from the civil society, such as the civic technologists, Howard Wu and Fin Zheng Kiang, created a tool without actually consulting the government. They created this tool called a mask rationing map. And so they enabled us to basically display when you're queuing in line, uh, once you purchase uh, some amount of mask, the people queuing after you can check on their phone in more than 100 different tools, uh, exactly how much did you just purchase from that pharmacy. And so it reduced unnecessary queuing and people can go to the pharmacy that still has some in stock instead of relying on guesswork and queuing in vain. Moreover, this also enabled independent analysts to point out data bias in our mask rationing system. We started rationing in last February, but uh, very soon we discovered that uh, it's not very uh, well evenly distributed. Indeed, this is MP Gao Hongan. Uh, she was VP of data analytics at Foxconn before joining the parliament. So she knows something about data. Uh, while initially we look at a map and see our population centers and the pharmacy distribution online almost perfectly, and we feel good about it. She pointed out working with the OpenStreetMap community, you can see in the background, in the interpolation that, that said, well, actually, not everybody owns a helicopter. So the time it takes for people to travel to a nearby pharmacy cannot be deduced by the distance uh, as seen on the map. So by pointing out the data bias and interpolating the Minister Chen Shizhong, uh, Minister didn't defend our policy at all. Instead, he simply said, well, legislator teach us. And so based on this infrastructure of evidence-based co-creation, we adjusted the uh, distribution mechanism the very next day. 
So MP Gao said, well, yesterday's interpolation became tomorrow's co-creation. And then we introduced, for example, uh, through entrepreneurship, some mask vending machines, uh, inclusion, for example, ordering uh, such masks in the kiosk in all the convenience stores around the island and so on, so that by last April, we reached the 75%. Um, and so for a long time after that, we've been kind of post-pandemic uh, until, of course, the English variant uh, found Taiwan, and now we're reaching for the 90%. So uh, if there is a takeaway uh, from this very short story about mask rationing, it's about engaging uh, the people in the uh, civil society to co-create based on shared evidence and shared data. And it's about investing in the digital public infrastructure, not just for collective intelligence, but also for fact-checking for finding uh, what's the trending disinformation and push out a funny clarification uh, 60 minutes after each uh, trending disinformation gets detected. Indeed, the participation officer in each ministry, which is in charge of working with, say, the comedians and the emerging hashtags, sometimes we call them the hashtag uh, part officers, <clears throat> they work uh, around the clock to push out this kind of vaccine of the mind <clears throat> that takes some mRNA strands, I guess, of uh, trending disinformation, package that into a humorous, almost comedic uh, package, and then spread it out as a viral meme so that the clarification uh, is even more viral than the original disinformation. So this is one of the earlier examples before COVID. <clears throat> there was a uh, rumor that said, uh, the state is going to fine you $1 million if you perm your head many times a week. Of course, that's not true. But we uh, posted this with no takedown. So just like the uh, counter pandemic relying on the public health measures, we also counter the infodemic relying on public mental health measures, which is framing the disinformation in a way that says it's not true, but also something that's more viral. For example, this is head of our cabinet, Premier Su, in his youth. Uh, and with his useful photo, he said, I may be bought now, but I will not punish people who look like my youth. Uh, and a fine print that says, uh, what we've introduced is a labeling requirement for hair products that takes effect on July 2021. And then the premier, as it looks now, says, however, if you perm your hair many times a week, it will not damage your bank account, but it will damage your hair. Just look at me now for what will happen to your hair. And again, this clarification proved to have a higher R value, a higher basic transmission rate than the disinformation. So by the time that this information reached people, they're already inoculated. There's antibodies of the mind in their mind because they would associate this disinformation uh, with the idea of, well, um, this premier's photo, right? Uh, and they will say, oh, it's just for a hair product labeling, and they will stop uh, just clicking share on social media and therefore, just like how vaccines work, uh, slow the um, distribution of this information through what I call nerd immunity, not herd immunity. Uh, and so this relies again on the civil society flagging incoming um, spam, right, or scam or disinformation. But we protect the right to communication secretly. So end-to-end -end encrypted channels such as WhatsApp or Line in Taiwan uh, is very popular. So how do we tackle the trending disinformation in these venues? Because usually they incubate there before reaching the more public po uh, social media. Well, we rely on the community called COFAX, which is part of the G0V initiative, Gov0 initiative. G0V is a very simple idea that says all the government services that ends in something that GOV, that TW, if the civil society think they can do it better, they will just do something that G0V, that TW. So just by going into uh, the that G0V, like join the GOV, the TW is our national participation portal. Changing an O to a zero gets you join the G0V, the TW, which is 10,000 people in a Slack channel brainstorming about how to do QR check-ins better, how to distribute vaccines better, and things like that. So it's a kind of shadow government that works on the principle of open source and open innovation. So COFA 
complex is the GovZero's um, contribution, so that anyone who looked at this um, scams or disinformation or just plain rumors, they can forward it to the bot developed by the community, and the bot would just like Wikipedia post the trending ones for people to independently analyze. It's all open data. So by forwarding it to the bot, it basically says uh, we're, we're um, contributing uh, just like flagging something as spam, uh, right? This um, foreign royalty, which want to wire uh, $10 million to my account or whatever, uh, we contribute that. So the spammer, uh, the next time they spawn, they reach the junk mail folder rather than the inbox of people. And we also partner with professional journalism people in the Taiwan Fact Check Center, part of the international fact checking network, so that they will just focus their energy on the ones that's already trending. So instead of spending time on the ones that are not trending and will just taper off automatically, uh, we focus our energy collectively on the things that require journalistic investigation. But for a long time, uh, this did not work on paid advertisements. Indeed, in 2019, uh, Facebook uh, introduced the Honest Advertisement Network, uh, I think first in Taiwan. Taiwan is the first jurisdiction that they realized uh, that it really is uh, possible for the uh, extra ju jurisdictional uh, forces to influence uh, and kind of bypass this crowdsource fact checking network simply by paying a lot of money and by precision targeted campaign donation like um, social issue or political issue um, advertisements. And so uh, we work with Facebook and other social media. We say, look, the PTT and other domestic social media already adopted this norm that advertisement during the campaign season is essentially campaign donation and should be treated as such. In Taiwan, we publish such donation and expenditure as open data. So we pressured Facebook and they also published uh, the kind of dark patterns of hyper precision targeting and so on, all as real time open data for investigative journalists to work with. And just like campaign donations, uh, they bond foreign sponsored propaganda on it, but all this without us actually making a new act, a new law, but rather the social sector threatens social sanction if the Facebook does not conform to the local norm. So this is what I call a people-public-private partnership, where the people, the social sector sets the norm, the public sector, the government amplifies the norm so that the private sector uh, implements the norm, and we work, for example, with the investigative journalists on such matters. So in the remaining, I guess, two minutes, I'll uh, just uh, show a, a few real examples. For example, leading to the 2020 uh, presidential election because the Hong Kong issue was the dominant issue. So we see this one having a really high R value in Taiwanese social media, and I quote, Hong Kong Flex Compensation Expo, killing a police earns you up to 20 million. How is that even possible? Well, it turns out this photo, uh, which makes it kind of viral, is from Reuters, it's a real photo. But the original caption only said, and I quote, a teenage extraction bill protester is seen during March, right? It's just that there are teenage protesters there. But the variant that went viral in Taiwan said, this 13 years old thug bought new iPhones and reusing the same photo. But as I mentioned, uh, we're a country of freedom of expression. Indeed, according to Civicus Monitor, we're the only jurisdiction in Asia that enjoys a completely open uh, freedom of speech and assembly and the press uh, space. So we can't take down, but we could do a public notice. So by adopting a notice and public notice, we just displayed on all the social media when people are about to share this, a frame, a contextualizing frame that said, well, look, this alternate caption was first seen on the Weibo account of the PRC, the People's Republic of China regime's central political and law units Weibo account. So this is uh, not, not something covert, it's overt. It's something that's taking a Reuters photo, changing its caption and seeding it as a social media viral package. And we notice that once we provide this contextualizing service, people who look at it actually earn uh, more media competence, or as we call it, not media literacy, but they earn the possibility to work like a journalist to provide a contextualizing frame to make sure that people understand, well, there is something going on that will change captions for photos later. There's also one around voting itself. On the day of voting, there was a trending disinformation that said the CIA made invisible inks. So no matter who you vote, your ink will disappear and Dr. Tsai will appear. Of course, that's not true. But again, the solution is not by banning the speech, but rather uh, by allowing 
during the counting, which is paper based, uh, the YouTubers of all the major parties. So if you don't trust the other parties YouTubers, you do trust your own parties YouTubers. And when all people can actually record live uh, the counting process and they have their own apps and because of universal broadband access, uh, streaming video and so on, uh, producing contextualizing evidence does not cost any extra money. So when the YouTubers in each counting stations report more or less the same number, again, there's no room for this uh, rumor to disappear, uh, to, to appear, to spread. And finally, there was a viral one that uh, said about distributing masks and I already mentioned what's important here is to make the tools so that people who are familiar with smartphone can use a map or they can use a chatbot or voice assistant and so on to know precisely where the mask is going and where the mask is rationing. And we've been uh, adjusting this system to distribute stimulus vouchers, um, nowadays vaccines very soon uh, and many other things as well. So people already live under the norm of radical transparency and there's less likelihood uh, for things to, to spread in a way that cap capitalizes on this lack of transparency. And finally, just as a kind of closing word, uh, I think uh, all these, uh, when I explain it, people sometimes remember it, but not necessarily share it. Uh, but when the cute Shiba Inu uh, explained the same thing, like when you're indoor, keep three Shibas away, outdoor, keep two Shibas away, or wear a mask, cover your mouth in this when sneezing, the masks are here to protect your face against your own unwashed hand and so on. Not only do people share it, but they remix it in a message that fits their local norms. And then this become something that we're in it together so that we work with the people not just for the people so that's my initial uh, intervention thank you very much audrey uh very interesting um i just want to say as well feel free to raise questions inputs in the facebook flow and uh, I, I will hope i can uh, raise it uh, later in this hour uh and very interesting audrey uh, i mean um Taiwan is one of the positive example of Corona fighting in the world. Uh, and I, I, you've been also involved with yourself as, as minister in, in developing the, the, these digital tools you talk about. Mm -hmm. However, there's some more spread now uh, mm -hmm. in, in recent times. But can you yep. say something about the overall uh, sort of uh, situation? How, uh, situation, yes. Sure. Um, so for the past couple of weeks now, uh, we're now in level level three. Level three is not a lockdown. People still move freely. There's plenty of people in the street. Uh, I, I just commuted back home. Uh, but uh, we do uh, require people wear a mask at all times uh, outdoors. Otherwise, there's a fine. Uh, and this is because the new variant the now demands a 90%, not a 75% uh, mask adoption rate. And the uh, uh, possibility of aerosol transmission uh, also increases. Uh, and so we've adopted a few new measures. Uh, for example, a SMS-based check-in system. So that, uh, of course, you can still choose pen and paper. But it's now much easier if you visit a convenience store or something, use your built-in camera on your phone to scan a SMS QR code that literally sends an SMS to the toll-free number 1922 to enable contact tracing. And the beauty of this is, of course, uh, the data is only stored in the telecom of your own number. So there's no extra uh, third-party data processor here. And even people who do not have a smartphone, but rather with a feature phone or something, around 20% of people do have the internet, but they don't know how to install an app, they can still just type in the place code and send it as SMS to it. And so it has a pretty good adoption rate. And again, this is actually designed by the Gun Zero community in the social sector. We just implemented kind of like a reverse procurement, like the mask map, implement what people feel comfortable with. So these are some new uh, measures. Uh, we're now registering uh, in the past couple of years, a total death of 59 people, uh, I believe, uh, which is a really high number by our standards now uh, in our second wave. Uh, but we're uh, looking at a uh, effective R value that's been more or less stable. So a few hundred cases every day. Uh, and we're seeing if the new level three measures can um, just uh, push down the number or maybe we finally go into level four. Uh, but currently it's not looking likely. Uh, because we uh, don't see it going on a spike. So it's just a few hundred cases every day, and maybe it will remain level four, uh, level three for another couple of weeks. 
Thank you. I think we have a lot to learn from, from the Taiwan example here in the future. Uh, so very interesting introduction. Um, let me move, move over to, to the question of democracy in Taiwan. Uh, it's interesting to see that uh, while the People's Republic of China uh, remained a dictatorship uh, after the turbulence and uh, after 1999, Taiwan has developed to a modern democracy. Can you say something about this development? Uh, well, when Taiwan moved to be a democracy and also the development in recent years in, in Taiwan. That's, I think that's interesting for us to know more of the mm -hmm. details there. Definitely. Um, in Taiwan, uh, I personally remember the martial law, right? Everybody 40 years and older, I remember the martial law. Uh, so I was born uh, in a environment where there's no freedom of press to, to speak of, uh, and people could be, you know, imprisoned or whatever uh, for acting in a way that doesn't uh, meet the, the uh, whims uh, of the, the ruling, the one ruling party. Uh, but after um, quite a few uh, peaceful civil movements of democratization, slowly the a room for civil society grew. Uh, and finally, in 1996, we had our first direct presidential election. Uh, and then afterward, after a few constitutional amendments, uh, we transitioned uh, into a, well, a real democracy. Uh, but the interesting thing for me uh, is that because 1996 is already a year where the World Wide Web is generally available. So when we designed uh, our new democratic system, already a lot of deliberative participatory democracy elements are in it. So, for example, um, every year um, we have a different vote. This year is the vote for re national referenda. Next year would be for the mayoral election. And then next year, the national referenda. And the next year, uh, pre the presidential uh, and legislature election and so on. So it's the alternating years uh, between a national referendum and mayoral and presidential elections. And there's also a um, highly participatory system joined the GOV, the TW, which I briefly mentioned, uh, that lists more than half the population uh, that sets the agenda on the regulatory issues as well as ministerial issues. Uh, for example, um, there was a very popular petition on banning plastic straws from takeouts of the national identity drink bubble tea. Uh, and then when we uh, collaborated with the petitioner, which gathered 5,000 signatures in a very short amount of time, we found out she's just turned 17. Uh, and when, when I asked her, uh, why are you petitioning this? She said, it's our civics class assignment. Uh, and so turns out that more than a quarter of citizen petitions are from people who are not 18 years old. So there's a lot of participation from 16, 17 years old. That's the highest demographic group uh, for online digital democracy. The next age group uh, is 60 and 70 years old. So I guess both sides have more time on their hands uh, and care more about uh, public welfare rather than their individual businesses and so on. Uh, so there's a strong deliberative culture. There's also participatory budgeting, uh, sandbox applications, presidential hackathon, many ways to uh, make sure that democracy is not just about uploading three bits per person every four years, but rather in a continuous fashion. And in that sense, calling into 1922 also counts as democratic input. Yeah. Can you say something about the sunflower movement, which sort of changed the political scene? Uh, I'm sure. Certainly. Certainly. Uh, in early 2014, uh, we occupied the parliament for around three weeks. Uh, and the demonstration was not a protest per se. It's more like a demonstration as a demo. Uh, because at the time, the parliament were refusing to deliberate substantially a trade agreement with the Beijing regime. Uh, and people just, I guess, took the MPs uh, office and because they were on strike, right? Uh, and worked their job. Uh, and so we demonstrated to half a million people on the street and many more online that with the right tools for listening and skill, it is possible to form an informed, good enough consensus about a very complicated trade deal. More than 20 NGOs uh, talk about more than 20 aspects, and they were live streamed, transcribed, translated, and so on.
on. Uh, for example, there was one uh, side of the parliament that deliberated uh, whether we allow the PRC Beijing components into our then new 4G telecom infrastructure ecosystem, where there, there are real private sector or they're all de facto state owned when the times comes. Uh, I'm sure everybody else uh, is now having this conversation right around the world on 5G in the past couple of years, but in 2014, we already explored that argument uh, and form a social norm that says um, no, that says there's no, uh, the economic sense uh, does not make sense because we will have to evaluate a systemic risk every time there's an update or something to see whether that so-called private sector has been de facto captured uh, by the you know extra market um, fares uh, of the, the PRC regime by you know switching leadership or some other uh, ways of influence. And if we have to keep assessing this, the total cost of ownership is much too high. And therefore we might as well uh, work on our own like uh, infrastructure, like with MediaTek and so on, uh, and also work with the likes of say Qualcomm or uh, Nokia or Ericsson and, and things like that. So the point here I'm making is that for each aspect of the trade deal, there is uh, a similar good enough consensus. And at the end of the Occupy, these were ratified by the head of the parliament, Wang Jinping. And so the Occupy was a victory. And around the end of that year in 2014, uh, they um, voted in all the mayoral candidates that supported open government and the sunflower movement, sometimes surprising even to the candidate itself, themselves. But uh, all the mayoral candidates that supported more a top-down authoritarian governance will simply lost the election. And so after that, uh, the political norm in Taiwan became one of open government, as I just uh, explained, and it become a nonpartisan issue. That is to say, all the four leading parties now in the parliament competes on how more transparent and participatory they could be. Nobody seriously argues for an authoritarian uh, regime. Interesting. Uh, I think we'll come back to that, uh, and, and also the international context in, in the region, uh, of course. Uh, now I'd like to give the word to Anna Sundström, General Secretary of the Olaf Palmer Center in Stockholm, uh, who's been engaged in, is engaged in international solidarity and fight for human, human rights as well. Anna, please. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, my name is Anna Sundström. I represent the Olaf Palmer International Center, which is the Swedish labor movement's uh, platform, you could say, for international cooperation and solidarity. Um, and I'm, I must just begin by saying that I'm very inspired uh, uh, listening to, to Audrey because I think that this uh, open government idea is also something that so many of us can also learn from uh, because we of course see how democracies challenge uh, all over the world. Uh, and that you know the the uh, right wing authoritarianism is is on the rise, uh, and we also see polarization, uh, well, basically threatening also quite stable democracies uh, in 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 also in our region here here in Europe. And uh, we often talk about well when sort of internet uh, was introduced. You mentioned it in in uh, also coinciding in a way with when you uh, started the democratic uh, process in, in Taiwan, uh, it was as if it was also something that would bring more democracy and so on. By the time when social media and so on has created the echo chambers, we sort of many times find ourselves in discussions on how to regulate this and how to, uh, well, hinder freedom of expression and so on. But what you have been doing is to really embrace uh, the, the positive sides. And I think that this is the, the right track to go. And that we, as I said, many of us can also learn from this because the, the discussion on whether or not internet is a tool of democracy or not is not that interesting <laughs> to me, to be honest, but rather uh, how can, can we make sure uh, to use these, to, this tool uh, to strengthen democracy? And I think that uh, your country has really done uh, a, a remarkable job on this. Uh, not to not the least to mention then this whole idea of, of open democ uh, government. And I think it's also what you finished by saying that it's so very interesting to then hear that this has caused sort of a competition rather in how to be even more transparent and even more mm -hmm. open. 
Yep. And uh, I'm also very inspired by what you said that it's uh, an, sort of a, an, uh, a vision to work with the people and not only for the people. I think that this is for all democracies to really challenge ourselves in finding these ways of inclusion uh, uh, of the people and to work with the people. And of course, uh, representing an organization compiled with uh, a number of civil society organizations working with their counterparts around the world to, to strengthen democracy. This is, uh, of course, something that we very much, uh, well, agree with the importance of including grassroots movements uh, and the importance of listening to people and to, to uh, build ways of inclusion uh, to strengthen democracy. Uh, one final remark from my side, of course, when it comes to then, uh, uh, someone wrote in the chat, I saw uh, Taiwan in the chat of, of China, which was also the, the, uh, uh, the name of the documentary Hokan uh, mentioned in his introduction. And uh, one of our member organizations uh, is the uh, Trade Union Confederation, ELO, here in Sweden. And uh, they have uh, their sister organization, Hong Kong CTU, uh, the Hong Kong Cong uh, Congress of Trade Unions in Hong Kong, uh, uh, well, experienced a lot of repression uh, during the last few years. And I think that the situation and how things have evolved in Hong Kong uh, is also a lesson to be learned also in our relations and in our support and cooperation with Taiwan. Uh, our friends in Hong Kong for many, many years said, uh, warned about the developments uh, that was about to unfold. Uh, the international community did not react uh, enough and also not soon enough to say uh, the least. And, and this is really a lesson that needs to be learned. And uh, just then coming back to Hong Kong CTU as one example, we now have the Secretary General uh, uh, in prison and the uh, chairperson of the organization also being uh, charged with multiple um, sentences or trials. Uh, we'll see what, how this evolves, of course. But uh, this is also a lesson to be learned for the international community. And I think you also put it very well that the sort of the economic gain is not a gain it's rather a, a high cost and uh, that is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that, uh, in this sense i think that uh, we've been maybe uh, well too naive and not counted on on sort of the full cost uh, that this kind of relationships uh, serve us we see only the economic benefits whilst we must also look at other aspects such as for example democracy and human rights Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, Audrey will have the possibilities to answer soon uh, or comment. Uh, but now I can give the, the word to Shastin Lundgren, a parliamentarian for, for the Centre Party and also a member of the Foreign Policy Committee. Uh, welcome, for Shastin. Thank you, and, and I hope you can hear me. I have uh, some problems with uh, uh, connections, so partly uh, Anna's remarks have been lost for me. I'm sorry for that. Uh, but I managed to get you, Audrey, and, and it, I saw the uh, media. Uh, um, you had a film in the Swedish uh, television, and it was great to see and to follow. And uh, getting your uh, uh, examples also now is uh, impressive, I must say. Uh, and you are, you are, um, when, when looking in the region as such, and the pressure. Taiwan is uh, feeling from from uh, your big neighbor. Uh, I mean that is uh, amazing to see uh, how you manage it and how far you have reached uh, in in uh, your uh, track to democracy, human rights, and the rule of law society. Uh, and uh, I think we have a lot to learn, and we are. Uh, I from the Swedish political life, I must say we are now uh, in different uh, ways, uh, but still more uh, looking into how to support Taiwan. We have seen what happened and we have seen uh, Xi Jinping's uh, uh, 
uh, moves and uh, the, the way he is, uh, where he is heading with the society. And uh, also have a lot of di discussions, of course, about how to manage uh, the new um, uh, era in the society, in the globe, uh, global era. Uh, when uh, we see that uh, we are moving into a new level of of uh, intelligent uh, uh, societies, smart societies, and uh, possibilities to to um, uh, in a way rule them uh, from uh, authoritarian uh, dictatorships and so on. And of course, for me, it's also interesting to see, you mentioned Ericsson, for instance, uh, as a way to uh, find your uh, your uh, way of doing things in, in Taiwan. Uh, for us, as uh, home for Ericsson, <laughs> homeland for er Ericsson, it's interesting to see how you, ma uh, how you look upon it, because we had just a couple of days ago a debate uh, um, if uh, Ericsson is uh, really um, pushed by uh, the Communist Party to uh, hand over information or to make some kind of uh, installations in the systems uh, for, for uh, getting the Chinese uh, interests uh, on board, uh, will they do it? Or can they stand uh, up uh, against it? And that's a big issue for for discussions. I, I think uh, globally, uh, making sure that that uh, we are, as you mentioned, uh, civil uh, civil uh, public and private. Uh, we are all linked together in this, and must make sure that we can build a strong. Um, uh, well strong, uh, um, some kind of guidance, uh, making sure that we are not tracked or, or um, backtracked into a system we don't want to see. Uh, so it's also interesting to see how you manage, because I mean, you are, you are a role model for, for uh, us in that sense, uh, due to that you have experienced uh, Hong Kong have experienced and you can see and you follow and you are smart in, in your ways of doing it. So I'm really interested to hear uh, and learn more about the way you are working and also how you are cooperating with other countries uh, for, for uh, connecting and, and uh, finding ways to, to uh, uh, counter the Chinese uh, uh, actions and moves. So, and of course, the issue of of, uh, of uh, solving or or uh, uh, helping people to uh, stay healthy uh, and not getting COVID is also impressive. The way you have done it, and we have a lot to learn from that as well. And we are uh, pushing for for uh, Taiwan to be uh, working inside the. Uh, World, World Health Organization, um, as uh, we are pushing in also other areas uh, to make sure that you are uh, involved and included in the way possible uh, into those uh, international uh, structures. And I think that is um, something we are trying to reach out and be helpful uh, to, uh, to uh, Yet, but it's not easy, as we all know. But uh, pushing is uh, something needed, really. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justin. Uh, a message from the Parliament. Uh, I would I would say in your latest comment there. Audrey, are you with us? Yes. Uh, do you, interesting. Do you have two comments from from Olaf Palme Center and then from the Swedish Parliament? Uh, do you have some comments? So far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the uh, contribution uh, to the conversation and for the support of Taiwan's meaningful inclusion in WHO and other meaningful um, 
assemblies of uh, nations. Uh, and we do see that there are more and more people who are willing to support Taiwan in such a manner. Uh, and we also build, for example, the global cooperation and training framework. And we're working to join, say, the Open Government Partnership. Um, there's many uh, nowadays international organizations that is predicated uh, on its membership being uh, democratic polities. <laughs> and uh, we uh, find more uh, willingness to engage uh, with Taiwan if uh, those what we call mini laterals but I, I mean OGP is uh, 80 or something countries so not really mini uh, but this multi smaller multilaterals non-UN scale multilaterals uh, that are more focused on human rights democracy and good governance uh, I think these are very fruitful venues uh, for us to work with and uh, with regard to the idea that social media and the polarization of conversation especially in democracies uh, I think that uh, really is true but we witness that we can actually build what I call pro-social media, meaning that uh, instead of relying on Facebook to talk about public issues, we build our own infrastructure like the PTT, uh, which are open source and um, stay subsidized by run independently so that people can have meaningful conversations without resorting to the more anti-social corners of social media. Uh, this is another example, this is called Polis. It's invented in Seattle, but now deployed as a permanent part of uh, governance infrastructure in Taiwan at polis.gov.tw. And we are looking at the actual conversation in 2015 uh, that talk about the UberX issue because UberX is a labor right issue. Uh, and people uh, see that the sharing economy is actually a gig economy, but some people say it's a platform economy. It's very difficult to have a real conversation around that in 2015. Uh, but using AI or assistive intelligence, we make sure that people share around the same facts, just their feelings. So you feel happy about this statement, I feel unhappy and it's all okay. There's no right or wrong about feelings. But after three weeks of sharing feelings online, the good ideas that are good enough consensus emerge. And then we can hold all the stakeholders to account by, for example, pointing out everybody feel passenger liability insurance is very important. If you agree, you move toward the person proposing this. If you disagree, you move farther away. But there's no reply button, so there is no room for troll to grow. And so every time after we run a police conversation for three work weeks or so, we see the divisiveness is very much quarantined, like five mm -hmm. ideological statements, people agree to disagree, but people spend far more calories on this, which means uh, most of people agree with most of their neighbors on most of the things, most of the time. It's just the anti-social corner of social media doesn't highlight this enough. Uh, and so after we hold these uh, to account and say, oh, let's just talk about uh, fair uh, payment to drivers, not undercutting existing meters, allowing existing co-ops, even church and temples, to start their own multi-purpose taxes and it's a one it made a new rule possible and now uber is a law abiding taxi fleet in taiwan the queue taxi and the local temples and churches and so on the serve the rural areas are also made legal by the new multi-purpose uh, taxi law and so this small example said to us uh, instead of relying on facebook which is like holding a town hall in a nightclub with very loud noise shout to get heard addictive drink private bouncers i mean with all due respect in fact, there are roles of nightlife district in the society, but the role is not one of town hall. We need to build a digital equivalent of town halls for town halls to happen. Thank you. Uh, lots of questions. Uh, one question I would like to raise is the de development in Hong Kong has been sort of a big part of the agenda. Uh, and my question is how has Hong Kong development influenced politics and, and, and the position for Taiwan lately. Yeah, as I mentioned uh, in our early 2020 presidential election, is the dominant thing, uh, factor, right? Uh, whatever illusions people had around, and I quote, one country, two system, end of quote, um, what was shattered uh, by, because Hong Kong was offered as a kind of demonstration, right, of the so-called one country, two systems um, design. Uh, and we see that there's no two systems at all, right? Uh, a, a systemic takeover happened uh, before our eyes and we've got uh, people flo 
uh, flying out of Hong Kong, some even took the boat uh, and uh, going on exile uh, in Taiwan. We offered them, of course, the safe space to talk to international journalists, to hold Oslo Freedom Forum and so on. And uh, it's, to me personally, it's, it's very interesting because when I was a child in the 80s, it used to be international correspondent in Hong Kong review the human rights violations in Taiwan for the international community to pressure the uh, government in Taiwan to do better. But now the role is entirely reversed and we've seen the international correspondents flying out of Hong Kong. Many of them are now based in Taiwan. Uh, there's some question on Facebook. I will raise some and then and also give the word to Anna and Shastin as well. Uh, Pontus Westerholm asks that um, in, in Europe, the question of regulating the, the sector, uh, tech sector is a, is a big issue. We have the GDPR legislation, etc. Mm -hmm. How is Taiwan handling this integrity questions? in terms of, of yeah, regulation. Right. As I mentioned, uh, we've had social sector alternative for 25 years now to Facebook. So it's not like Taiwanese people don't use Facebook. There's probably more Facebook accounts than people in Taiwan uh, because some people hold two accounts. Uh, but we, we don't use them as town halls. As I as I mentioned, the binding decisions on e-petition, on participatory budgeting, on referendum and so on, they don't take place on Facebook. People understand Facebook is a place for, you know, like the nightlife district, but it's not a place for a deliberation for a town hall-like discussion that has binding effect on democracy itself. That is to say we don't confuse private infrastructure with civic infrastructure. And therefore the civic infrastructure sets a better norm for Facebook. And Facebook, I think one of the whistleblowers in the Facebook Civic Integrity Group uh, went on the record um, a couple of months ago saying uh, in the jurisdictions such as Taiwan where they would suffer a PR backlash, uh, they actually uh, respond to the election meddling and so on in a very quick manner. But in the jurisdiction that did not, they, they don't anticipate such a strong check and balance from the social sector, well, they didn't uh, allocate sufficient resource to it. And, and for, for us, it's like a, I, I don't know, backhanded compliment <laughs> to our social sector activity so that Facebook simply cannot ignore uh, the negative externalities, sort of like environmental pollution uh, that they did uh, to the, um, ideas sphere i guess around public discussion and so for things like the transparency around advertisements for things like transparency around foreign meddling and sponsorship and advertisement and many other things facebook did uh, actually work with the local social norm simply because they know there is a viable alternative and they will face social sanction uh, credible social sanction even before we made any laws uh, for that thank you i have a question to anna and shastin both of you uh, all over the world, also Sweden has uh, had a sort of low-key relationship with Taiwan. Uh, it's it's a, it's a cause for historical reasons, a problematic question. Uh, what do you think about the future? Should should Sweden and other countries be more active in, in developing contacts with Taiwan in terms of political uh, relationships, recognition of the Taiwan as a, as an independent state, etc.? Uh, Anna first. What? Don't forget to. Oh, yes. uh, absolutely, I, I do think so. And I think that not the least also as the world uh, develops as it does, we need to find ways of uh, cooperating more among the democracies uh, around the world. And also, of course, uh, to keep dialogue and to, to support also uh, the strives for democracies in countries and that also evolves in, in an authoritarian way. Uh, and to find ways of also supporting uh, the the democratizations in uh, the democratization processes in in also in these countries. Um, so absolutely, yes, that would be my short answer. Thank you, and Shastin. Yes, I fully agree. We need to uh, work out a new model of, of cooperation, and uh, I have, for instance. Swedish uh, uh, office uh, in Taiwan uh, is now a business uh, office, but I have uh, requested and suggested House of Sweden 
to be uh, uh, operating in Taiwan, making sure that we are upgrading uh, our uh, relations and our cooperation, not only in uh, business area, uh, I mean, they have a little uh, other things as well, but making sure that this is a message of uh, cooperation and uh, working together uh, in a stronger way. Um, and uh, I hope this will be uh, possible uh, Taiwan is uh, a very good uh, uh, island for cooperation uh, in the uh, region and for us to learn and work out together also uh, when we are talking about uh, the systemic ri uh, rival, China, how to handle the situation. May I also add that I think that it's also important for Sweden to take an active role in pushing for this in the European Union, because, uh, of course, it's also important that we do this uh, together, because that would also mean be a much stronger uh, signal and voice when, when the European Union also acts uh, together. Uh, you mentioned, of course, the, well, the tensions around this issue, and if we would have a more of a joint effort uh, I think that that would also be very meaningful. Yes, of course it is. But I mean, we can also, uh, we, I think we have to join forces. Uh, you mentioned, Audrey, mini, <laughs> mini uh, clubs. Laterals. Uh, and, yes, mini laterals. Uh, uh, <laughs> mini laterals, yes. And we have mini EU as well <laughs> inside. And, and we have already European countries uh, with House of Austria, House of Netherlands, and so on. And I think we should add up uh, and moving not with um, balloons and all other things like that, uh, trumpets and so on, but making it uh, visible uh, in a smart way uh, and by that building up uh, cooperation because we have uh, a lot to, to work out to, uh, together with Taiwan and other uh, countries, Australia and others in the region, South Asia. Thank you. Uh, there's lots of questions in the Facebook flow. We don't have the time to put, raise more of them. Uh, I only want, want to say that Ole Westberg, who is um, working on democracy development in, in, for the Swedish government in, in, uh, in recent years, he says that Taiwan is, uh, is impressing in terms of giving people a voice in committing to political decisions between the elections. Tell me more about this, please. And that will be the final comment from you, Audrey. Okay. Definitely, and yeah, we're, we've uh, just three uh, minutes to, to go. I guess I'll just go through a, a few quick slides, uh, but uh, I, I've done a TED Talk, actually three TED Talks uh, about this, so the, more, more on the TED Talk. So for example, uh, every year we run a presidential hackathon. This year, uh, there's an international track that focus on climate action. And I welcome you to check out presidential hackathon Taiwan and you'll see the, the idea. And the idea really is very simple uh, for people who work on, for example, better algorithm to uh, detect water leakage in the water pipes. Uh, they can actually co-create across sectors on a small prototype uh, in a small region. And then they contribute a code for the cross sectoral collaboration, they won a trophy. Every year we hand out five such trophy that is shaped like Taiwan with a micro projector underneath. And when you turn on the projector, it shows Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president, handing you the trophy. So it's a very meta trophy. Uh, and what it symbolizes is that we commit the presidential power to turn your social innovation from being just a small district into a national-wide rollout, usually within 12 uh, months. And that means that the social sector ideas and innovations became national agenda very quickly thanks to the collaborative. Uh, and so instead of kind of the civil society fighting the government on one another on issues, instead of democracy being a showdown between opposing values, we encourage co-creation so that it become a conversation between diverse values. This is my office, quite literally my office, the Social Innovation Lab. So people can have a real conversation here uh, for uh, whatever sustainable development goals uh, related issues. And we always keep this conversation on the record, either as a transcript or as a movie. And because the kind of future is watching, right? We always publish. People always talk about their new ideas in the um, canvas 
of effective partnerships instead of the short-term short-sightedness of the Chinese because it simply look very bad, right? So uh, by be becoming a good enough ancestor in this role of radical transparency, we make sure that we build the innovations based on the norms, the social needs, and then we get the sectors together. So when I became the digital minister in 2016, uh, because I'm the first uh, person who hold the role of digital minister, the HR asked me, well, so how do you describe your role? I'm like, oh, I'm just 17, 18, 17, 17, 17, 6 in terms of the sustainable goal targets, reliable data, effective partnerships, and open innovation. And they're like, not all Taiwanese people memorize the 169 targets by, by uh, mind, right? have to translate it. And so uh, I'll just conclude by reading my job description, which is about using technology, uh, bringing it to the people, not the other way around. And it goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it the Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Odur. That's a perfect uh, ending of this very interesting seminar. Thank you for joining us. It's wonderful that we can, we can have this conversation when you're in Taiwan and we're here in, in, in the north of Europe. A special thanks, of course, also to Shastin Lundgren and Anna Sundström. Thank you very much, and we will be back on Taiwan questions in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Live long and prosper. Bye.